What's up, witches? It's Megan. Welcome back to my channel. Today, I was inspired by Drew from She Who Walks Between the Worlds and Trish from Beanbag Hagwag to speak more openly about the deity that I work with and my particular personal path with her. Um, so, I guess we can just talk about it. Um, I do want to announce real quick, though, that I am hosting a giveaway. As I've said before, this giveaway is for hitting 200 subscribers here on YouTube. Um, podcast listeners, this giveaway is open to you as well. This giveaway is open to anyone that follows me or partakes in any of my content in any form. Um, I did hear back from a few people on what you would like to win as part of a giveaway, and I think I've decided that the winner will get to choose between a custom altar cloth or a personalized guided meditation. So that is up for grabs, and the winner will get to choose which one they want. The giveaway will start today, May 11th, and it will run all the way through until the end of May 31st, and then a winner will be announced the next week after that. Um, I will be announcing the winner live either on Facebook or Instagram. I haven't decided yet. And that leads me into my next thing is if you don't read the show notes, then you would not have known that I just decided to create a new Instagram. If you were following me before, go ahead and follow me again if you want. It's still round the cauldron, but it's round underscore the underscore cauldron. So I'll leave a link for that in the description and in, in the show notes too if you want to follow me there. And the link for the giveaway is also in the description and in the show notes below. The next thing that I wanted to talk about before we hop into talking about my deity is that I will be moving in June. The movers will be at my house on June 20th and we will be embarking on a journey across the country. We are moving from Oregon to Florida and it's going to take several days. So honestly, the content and my videos and the podcast from probably halfway through June and July is going to be pre-scheduled. Um, I don't want to go on a hiatus. I don't want to stop my content. Since it will all probably be pre-scheduled, those podcast episodes and videos will probably be shorter because I'm going to have to record all of them ahead of time. But if there's a specific topic you want covered or if you have a question, let me know and I will try to take care of that in those pre-recorded times. Um, I also probably will do a little vlog for our trek across the country, um, depending on what is open, if anything is open. Um, we might stop at a couple of places. Honestly, I'm not sure though. Obviously, social distancing will still be going on. Um, that I think, in my opinion, it's just good practice. Just stay six feet away from me. Um, but I'm hopeful that some things will be open to at least go look at. There is, I think it's pronounced the Parthenon in Nashville that I want to go see. And I think that would just be an amazing opportunity. And honestly, I have never been as far as Kansas and Oklahoma in my own country. So I have never been to the East Coast or any of those areas and it's something that I want to do. But anyway, um, all of that just to say that my content for probably half of June and half of July is going to be pre-scheduled. I'll still be around but not probably not as much as I am now. So again, if you have questions or a topic you want me to cover, during those particular times, let me know and I will do my best to accommodate that. Also, yes, YouTube, um, I figured out how to do a green screen and I don't have a great place to record, so you get to have this pretty background. So, as I said, this topic was inspired first by one of Trisha's videos. Um, she has a channel, Beanbag Hagwag, on YouTube. I will leave a link to her channel and also Drew's channel in the description below. But Trish talked about how a lot of people are 
not necessarily afraid, but hesitant to come out and talk about their own personal experiences with their deities or the gods and goddesses or higher beings that they work with or worship. And I could tell in Trisha's video that it was maybe a little difficult for her, um, if not difficult, uh, very emotional. But it was a beautiful video, beautiful sentiment. And the same thing with Drew. I mean, the main reason that I wanted to talk about this as well is because I don't feel like we should be hesitant to speak about our personal experiences within our own faith and within our own religious path. I know a lot of shaming goes around and... I will admit that there are times where some of the things that I see on Twitter or Instagram either border on cultural appropriation or they are downright cultural appropriation, but I still don't feel like we should be hesitant to share our experiences because that's the way everyone learns, that's the way I learn, that's the way you learn if you're watching this on YouTube or listening to the podcast, you know, you're listening to it for a reason, right? Either I'm talking about something you're interested in or I am teaching you something based on my own experience and research. You know, if we don't share those experiences and share how we feel about certain situations and the things that we go through within our spirituality, then it sort of stays a taboo topic and it stays in the shadows and becomes something that people aren't able to learn from. So I do think it is something that needs to be talked about. Obviously, there are some things that are better kept private. Maybe you have a contract or part of your oath with your particular god or goddess is that silence and that secrecy. For sure, I'm not talking about situations like that. Please keep your oaths and your contracts with your deities and your gods and goddesses. Um, I don't want to be responsible for you breaking those oaths just so you can talk about your spiritual practice because I said it's a good idea. It's not a good idea if you're contracted to be quiet. What I'm, what I'm talking about is... I'll use myself as an example, okay? I come from a Wiccan background. Like, most of my background in paganism and witchcraft comes from Wicca. It wasn't until recently, within the last year or two, that I officially left Wicca or considered myself to have left Wicca and moved into Irish paganism. Now, my ancestors are from Ireland and through my mom's genealogy research we can trace that back, but I would never have the opportunity, I want to say, to learn about traditional Irish practices if it wasn't for people like Laura O'Brien or Orla Costello. I believe I'm saying their name correctly. Um, but Laura O'Brien is a fantastic resource. They are native to Ireland. They live in Ireland. They were born there. They grew up there. They are, uh, they call themselves a native Irish Dri, which is a modern day Druid. And they are also a priestess of the Morrigan. But Laura has dedicated so much of their time and energy and everything to the education of the community to make sure that those who are looking for authentic Irish connection and authentic connection to Ireland and the Irish practices to make sure that we are getting accurate information and getting information from the source and that is something that I appreciate so so much. I will leave Laura's information in the description and in the show notes. If you're interested in Irish paganism at all, they are a great resource. So definitely check them out later. But if Laura never felt like they could come forward and speak about 
the native Irish practices and the practices of Irish paganism and Irish Dri, then I would never have found an amazing resource. I would probably still be stuck in the Celtic land of Celtic Wicca, which isn't what I wanted. And it just goes to show that the people who are out there sharing their experiences and sharing their knowledge are an asset to our community. And I feel like we all need to be comfortable sharing those parts of us, um, if not for feedback or to ask questions, then to just be another asset to the community to help, you know, weed through everything and wade through the murky waters of misinformation that runs rampant in the pagan community. So today, I wanted to speak a little bit about Brige or Bridget, um, how she came to find me, how we work together, how I worship and honor her, and what that entails for me. I've never really talked about Brige in depth before. Um, and I say Brige. Brige is the Irish pronunciation of her name, Brige. And I'll get to why, why I say it like that uh, towards the end of this episode because there is a reason. But if you're unfamiliar, which you might be, I'm not, I'm not sure, but Brige is an Irish goddess seen in three aspects. Now, this is not something that is like the Wiccan triple goddess. It's different. Some stories in the folklore say that Brige is one goddess with three aspects. Some stories say that Brige is uh, three sisters. I haven't read all of that folklore yet. I do plan on it, but I can't say for sure. I do know that in a lot of the Irish folklore and mythology, there's a lot of contradictions because of the way it was uh, recorded, but that's a topic for another day that I don't know enough about to talk about right now. But Brige is a goddess of poetry, a goddess of healing, and a goddess of smithcraft. So she is a goddess of creation and fire and inspiration and creativity and midwifery and protection of children and the home and the hearth. There is a lot that goes into Brige. And she's not this, you know, nice, fuzzy, soft, squishy goddess. She can be. She can be that motherly figure. Um, there was a time a couple of months ago where I was kind of in a slump and I went to my altar and was trying to light my candles and incense. And I was just thinking to myself, you know, my altar was a mess. There was incense, ash, everything everywhere. And my lighter wouldn't work. I could not light my lighter and it had never happened before and there was nothing wrong with it. So I'm trying to light my candle, I'm trying to light my incense and it's just not working. So I'm looking at my altar and I'm looking around at how messy it is and I made a promise. I said, I promise I will clean this later. I will clean up my altar later. I will dust it and organize it and get it in the, get it in order. And as soon as I made that promise, my lighter worked. I was able to give my offerings, my incense, my candle to Brige. And that was just sort of a, I got kind of a motherly feeling from that, sort of saying, you know, hey, I know you feel like crap right now, but you need to get your butt in gear and get this done. However, there, there's also another side to her where she is that fire and she has the ability to create but also destroy. And she is not that fluffy goddess that everybody thinks that she is. And I think it's amazing. So Brige is part of the, um, part of the Tua de Danan, which means folk of the goddess Danu. Uh, sometimes it was shortened to be the Tuade, which means tribe of the gods. And then later in the folklore, they became known as the East, the East She. I, ooh, I think I'm saying that right. I'm still practicing that. But they became later known as the quote unquote fairies of the other world. 
and there's a lot that goes into their mythology that I'm still learning. I don't really know how she found me. I know how I found her, but I've talked about this kind of choosing your deities in another podcast episode. I'll link it below, but I, I called it The Gods Aren't Socks, okay? And if you haven't listened to that one, I recommend you listening to that one too. But I have been aware of Brige for a while, and I really started to connect with her through my crochet, through my craft of creating things with my hands, a hook, and essentially a piece of string. And it just, it went from there. I started giving her offerings and just talking to her and saying, you know, hey, I'm here, this is for you, but I don't expect anything in return. I'm, you know, trying to connect with you if you will have me. And the relationship just sort of grew from there and it's still growing. I still have days where sometimes I don't feel like she's close enough. And then I have some days where I can just feel her everywhere. And I think that's just the nature of paganism in general. Sometimes when you work with a deity, they need to take a step back sometimes. Maybe I needed to learn something on my own or I needed a bit of that tough love, like not being able to light my lighter to use for my candles and incense. But I started connecting with her mainly through my craft, mainly through my crochet and weaving spells of healing and calmness and positivity in all of the work that I make. And it just sort of blossomed and grew. Do I know why she persists and stays? No, maybe it's just because I give her offerings and she's here and she's providing protection for my hearth and home. Maybe she has ulterior motives. I don't know. All I know is that she is close to me and I have never felt this level of spirituality and contentment, I guess I would say, of a piece of my faith and a piece of my religious belief before, not until I started working with and giving offerings to Brige. And she is, she is a part of my life. She is a part of everything that I do. When I'm crocheting, she is there. When I'm cooking dinner, she is there. When I am lighting my candles and incense and giving her offerings, she is there. She is in everything that I do. And I, it's such, I've never, okay, so I've never talked about it in depth like this, but it is such an amazing feeling. And it's kind of surreal to think that I have the attention of Brige, of this amazing goddess, of this amazing being that is part of the Tua de Danan. You know, it's, it's surreal to me still. And it might be like that forever. I, I have no way of knowing. But she brings me joy and happiness and that spark of fire and creativity. But she also brings me that tough love and that kick in the pants when I need to get my butt up and get stuff done. Now, there's another thing that I want to talk about that I've spoken with my sister-in-law and my friend about just briefly. But I, for, for several months now, I have been tossing around the idea, I want to say, of dedicating to Brish, of saying, you know, dedicating myself to her service and the th things that she needs done and bringing her into the everyday for everyone else and sort of encompassing what she stands for in my life. I had been tossing around that idea for a while 
honestly, dedication and being oath-bound and contracting with deities and other beings, it's a serious topic and it's not something that should be done lightly. So, that's why I didn't just willy-nilly do it. Even though I've been working with her and honoring her and giving her offerings, it's not something to just hop right into. But on Bealtaine or Beltane, I did my ritual. I went into my living room. I sat in front of my wood-burning stove and I had my candles and I called out to her and I meditated and I lit my candles and I pulled out my tarot cards and I meditated on the idea of dedicating to her and <laughs> I got a resounding no, you are not ready. And it really, honestly, it didn't surprise me because deep down I know I'm not ready for something like that. I know 100% I am not ready. But there was more to it that she had to tell me. And it has to do with my lack of knowledge. You know, I'm not going to sit here and say that I know everything that needs to be known about Brige and Irish paganism enough to dedicate my path to her and to Irish paganism in general. And I got a resounding absolutely not. Like, you are totally not ready for this. And she says that I'm not ready because I don't know enough. She wants me to learn her language and learn her stories. But not just her stories, the stories of... Ireland and the Tua de Danan and the mythology and the folklore. And she said, then maybe you'll be ready. And I have never felt like that during a meditation. And it wasn't, it wasn't disappointment. It wasn't like, oh man, I'm not ready. She said no. It was different. I have never received messages that strong before from guides or gods. And it was so powerful. And I'm not sure if it's because I did the ritual on Bealtaine when um, the world, or not the world, the veil between the worlds is supposed to be the thinnest, as they say. But in all of my years as a pagan even as a Wiccan, nothing has ever hit me as strong as that. And even though she said no, I'm not discouraged. I'm not disappointed. If anything, it is a push for me to do better and work harder. But it's also a, uh, a validation that I'm on the right path, that I am um, following the steps that I need to follow in the direction that I need to go. And I say this because I've never, in my pagan experience, received messages that powerful or felt the energy and the strength from those messages like that before. So... I have a lot of learning to do still. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Brige is the first goddess that I have developed a relationship with, I want to say. She is the first goddess that I have sought out on my own and that I have worked closely with. Because when I was a Wiccan, it, it always felt very impersonal to me. Lord and Lady, God and Goddess. Like, okay, but who are they? And I know in some traditions, Wiccans choose from a pantheon and worship or honor those deities, but that never felt right to me. So, Wicca always felt so impersonal. And this experience with my Bealtaine ritual just lets me know that I 
I'm going in the right direction. Bridge is there for me and steering me in the, I keep saying in the right direction, but steering me where I need to go in order to be closer to her and in order to move closer to that path of dedication to her and to Irish paganism and living those values. So I don't have like some massive story about how I came to find Brige or how she came to find me or how she saved me or anything like that. It's, it's a little more simple than that. Um, it's just, I needed her and I found her when I needed her and she responded. And it's as simple as that. You know, she is, she is there for me when I need that push to either get something done or to take a break. She is a reminder to myself that I can't do everything. That even though I have this power to create this passion and this fire, if I let that fire get out of control, it has the ability to destroy everything in its path. And she is a reminder to myself that if I'm not careful, that's what's going to happen to me because that's how I am. I have a tendency to just go, go, go when I need to get things done. And I don't take breaks. I don't stop. I don't take time to relax. I need to always be doing something. But she is that reminder and she will put something in my path to say, no, stop. You're gonna hurt yourself. You're gonna run yourself ragged. You're gonna exhaust yourself. You're gonna stress yourself out. She is that reminder to me that I need to take care of myself and my family because if I can't take care of myself and I can't take care of my family, then I can't do the things that she needs me to do. So, I hope you enjoyed this sneak peek, I guess, into my own personal worship practices. If you have any questions or comments or anything of the sort, leave them in the comments below. Podcast listeners, reach out to me through social media. Um, I would love to hear your experiences with your own deities. So, if you have a channel on YouTube and you want to, I encourage you to cover this topic. Um, if you have a blog, again, I encourage you to write about this. Um, if you don't have anyone to share your experiences with in, you know, close proximity to you and you don't have a blog, send me an email or comment on the show notes page for this episode. I, I think it's important that we all learn from each other and allow ourselves to be open to the knowledge of other people and to their experiences as well. So, I will see you next time. Bye for now. I want to take this time to thank my patrons over on Patreon. Thank you, Jess, and thank you, Rose, at wickenhomestead.com. If you want to help support the show, join me over at Patreon at patreon.com slash roundthecauldron.